whether that that's a business decision or a creative decision. It's all super hard, but as long as you feel like you're honoring your 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 inner voice at its quiet moment, you know, whether that's meditation, like it, it should lead you the right way. Hi everybody, my name is Cameron Pinches. I'm the business development manager at Coverfly, and I'm joined today by Scott Glasgold from Ground Control. Scott's a producer and um, runs the production management. Uh, company Ground Control and has been kind enough to join us for a chat about hopefully all things marketplace and career and industry and so on and so forth. So, Scott, thanks so much for giving us your time. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, always happy to talk. Awesome. I'd love to sort of start, I think, perhaps with with the formation of of the company and um, and sort of perhaps your journey up until that point. Um, so, maybe even going a step before that, what was your journey up until now overseeing ground control and what sort of drove your motivation for wanting to to be in the industry i suppose sure uh those those are a lot of questions so i'll (laughs) I'll try to put a a circle around it i i find that the origin stories are are uh uh, can sometimes put people to sleep so i'll I'll give the highlights and if i leave anything out please ask me um out of school I, i was fortunate enough to take a studio route i was hired out of school to work for Disney in the marketing department. Um, and then from there, I went to work for New Line Cinema. All of this was in New York City, actually, which was a unique opportunity. So New York kind of ebbs and flows as to when uh, uh, there's real sort of film business happening. And I, I was fortunate enough to graduate at a time when there was, uh, particularly at New Line, where um, there's a very active development operation there. Uh, so it was also at a time where New Line wasn't quite as big as it is now. So you really got to see um, the the entire process from scripts coming in, being developed, uh, being produced and released from start to finish. So that I always look at that as my film school. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, I, I ultimately came out west to Los Angeles, which um, depending on the type of movies you look to pursue, um, uh, meaning New York, you could probably stay and do a lot more indie work, but I, I had a, um, a different sort of sense of what I wanted to do. So I came out to Los Angeles not long after being out here, I made a movie called Hurricane Season that Tim Story directed and Forrest Whitaker started with Taraji Henson and Lil Wayne. And that was a really great experience. And that was sort of, if, you know, it, it, it was a true boot camp because we were really thrown into making a movie in, in Louisiana under, um, I, I guess, no film is ever easy, but it was, it was particularly challenging uh, circumstances. Um, but we made the movie and I was very proud of it. And I came out of that. Um, and I, I formed a company with uh, a man by the name of Raymond Brothers, who, whom I produced that film with. And he was a very prominent sports agent, still is today. And from there, uh, we, we built out a company that was both sports and entertainment. And I focused on the entertainment side. Um, and that what started out as sort of uh, focusing on producing ultimately evolved into managing as well. And my initial focus in, in the management world uh, was primarily with what I call world builders. Um, it was at a time when short films were really sort of cutting through a lot of the noise. And I was working with a lot of filmmakers who were able to write, direct, and produce short films that felt really big in scale. A lot of them were, were science fiction and horror. Um, and we had a lot of success setting things up, and we made uh, a couple of films, uh, including uh, Prospect, that uh, Deke and Chris Caldwell directed, uh, that Pedro Pascal started. Um, and that was sort of a proof of concept ever proof of concept of that, of that model working. Uh, and then um, uh, around then is when uh, I, I started my own company, Ground Control. We, we, I went my separate ways with my partner. Um, that The sports side of that company uh, sold to, to Jay-Z, actually. So then I, I took the entertainment side. And that, that was Ground Control. And from there, it was uh, growing business, working with writers, directors, producing, um, and I think probably what brings us here today is sort of the evolution of, of a model that was the first iteration probably you, you would say would be with the short films. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, I started developing short stories as means of basically creating IP and packaging film projects. And over the past two years, uh, we've had a lot of success in, in engineering projects, um, really at, at the highest level. It all started with a short film that uh, Harrison and Matt Query wrote called My Wife and I Bought a Ranch that um, 
it, it was just fantastic. And we sold that. I mean, I think I read that on Tuesday. By Friday, we, we'd sold it for over a million dollars. Wow. Um, it, and, but it was extraordinary. The writing was extraordinary. And uh, we partnered with James Wan and Netflix bought it. It was, just, it was a really big deal, but it was very illuminating for me. And it was illuminating uh, on, on a lot of levels. And ultimately, what I did was took sort of the blueprint of what we had been doing with the short films and moved it over to short stories. And what I find, I, I love short films too. I should preface all that with uh, what I'm about to say. But short stories are very malleable. Uh, on every level. Uh, what I mean by that is scope and the iteration. It's a lot easier to refine and get it absolutely right with a short story over a film where you've got three days and you know you pray you got everything you need. Um, also, in terms of putting the pieces together, a short film is far more malleable, um, meaning work with really fantastic prose writers, um, but their intent isn't necessarily to write a feature film. Uh, so they're very so often when we sell these projects, the prose writer will then go write the book, and they're very satisfied with that end development. They've written a short story that's being adapted into a film at the highest level, and they're going to write a novel. They've got a, a book deal, uh, but it also leaves that space—the same space that the short film didn't leave. Uh, it leaves that space for screenwriters, where their craft is, <clears throat> excuse me, to adapt screenplays, to write screenplays, um, and then equally it gives room for then. Uh, directors and actors to on board because you're we're, we're bringing in talent at the highest level it then um, is is just they're just more apt to trust that process whereas short films again love them I think they're perfect for certain types of movies particularly horror that don't require a cast um, or, or a big budget um, uh, because ultimately you're dealing with most likely a first timer we deal with the first timer Talent is going to be reticent to, to work with them as well as studio to invest. But when you have a short film, it, it's totally wide open. So you can curate at the highest level. And, and we've really been very fortunate enough to do that. The, the town has um, responded very, very warmly to our model. I mean, we're, we're, it's, it's now at this point working with you know, sort of a, a, a dream list of both filmmakers and actors. Uh, we just sold uh, a project over the weekend to Sony called It's Over that Akela Cooper, uh, who wrote Megan, is writing. And, and it, it's it's really sort of a dream to, to be developing a short story. And when you're developing it back in mind, say, oh, that would be my number one choice to adapt. And we go to them and they say yes. Um, before that, we before the, the strike, we did a, The Dwelling that Michael B. Jordan starring in and Aaron Kuzikowski wrote Prisoners is writing. And I felt with Misha Green and Zach Kreger and Sidney Sweeney and Blake Lively. So it, it's really proven to be this great vessel. Um, and I find it to be incredibly rewarding for all parties involved. Uh, for the for the prose writer, it's a really wonderful opportunity to kick off their career because inevitably, um, beyond the gratification and financial upside of, of selling your, your short story, um, in selling a short story to film, there all of a sudden, thankfully, is then a long line of publishers very excited to um, turn that into a book. Um, so it, it really, for lack of a better phrase, it gives them an opportunity to level up at, at an accelerated rate. And um, that's that's very much where, where I, I spend my time today. Yeah, amazing. I mean, it really sounds like with that strategy, you've, you've kind of appeased everybody and given everybody a seat at the table. You use the term malleable. So you've got a piece of IP that everybody understands needs to be expanded upon in terms of scope and, you know, page count and everything else. And it seems that perhaps that conversation with whoever's written that short story, that the, that expectation is that I, I understand that a screenwriter is going to come in and do their take on this, and so I'm not going to be perhaps as precious about needing to hang on to it. Is that is that sort of fair? Is that your experience? It, it's th that would I would say that would be the majority of of our situation. Um, again, a, a prose writer has a very specific craft. A screenwriter has a very specific craft, and the exception is the overlap, where there are a handful of screenwriters that I work with who are equally talented at pros, the, the mm. Query brothers being one of them. So they, they often will stay on and adapt their own shorts. So it, it's always going to be case specific. Um, but I think it's really about um, malleable is a great word in that um, 
I mean, all the way down to even what a short story provides. And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> of course, everything's being adapted into a script. But what I found in the early stage development with the screenplay, getting people to commit, sometimes the blueprint of a screenplay can feel very binding. It could feel like if I'm saying yes to this, I'm committing to this precise thing. And I find that that could be daunting and inhibits people from saying yes. Whereas a short story is um, a nice uh, intermediary level to come on board where both entrepreneurial and creatively where you can still shape it. You can put pieces together and even looking at a short and say, oh, well, I loved 80% of this. I hated this. And being able to 86, let's say an ending or an element um, is a lot easier in the short because then when you go sit down at the table to, to adapt the scripts, like this is what we like. This is what we, I mean, we literally had a kickoff meeting for a project this week and we went through the short. I was like, this is what we want to make sure we keep. And this is what we want to make sure we don't. And, you know, sometimes if you do that with the screenplay, it sort of creates like that Jenga element, right? And you pull something and it all falls apart. But because it's still in what feels like a developmental stage, uh, it's a bit easier to uh, make those adjustments. And, oh. and look, I say all that to say there, there's nothing more glorious in the world than a perfect spec script, or there's nothing you know better than an amazing short. All, all these things are still incredibly viable, and I welcome them all with open arms. Uh, but this, this pathway here um, has, has equally proven to be really valuable. Yeah, it kind of leads into the next thing I was going to say and, and ask. It's almost like you've kind of jumped onto the other side from the buyer's perspective and been like, what's how, what's the best way that I can present something, a piece of IP or something to option um, that gives them the greatest amount of scope and influence where they can insert their own creative take on it rather than, as you said, you know, I think we all know of examples of perhaps a specialty studio buying a spec script for $5 million. And then it's like, it's a page one rewrite. We just want to work with that writer and that concept, but it's going to take two years to, to build it out again. It's was all of that in your consideration when coming up with the strategy. Um, I mean, not necessarily consciously. I, I think it a little bit speaks to taste and how I like to curate. And um, I really am a, big believer in concepts and big ideas. Uh, I, I, that's what excites me, you know, to, to hear that one liner or two liner. And when it clicks, you're like, Oh my God, it's a great idea. And it's fresh. Th those are the type of movies that I like. Um, and I think it's that like, if you can achieve the balance of creatively feeling um, fresh and original, but also feeling like, a, a very viable commercial entity. That's just that's just where my sort of Venn diagram lines up. So that's what excites me. Um, so I, I I always aim for that. You know, does it feel fresh? Does it feel unique? So um, so y yes, hopefully that plays to market. Hopefully, you know, the the litmus test that we use to apply to these pieces um, uh, proves out and you know proves to be right. But it 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 aligns hopefully with what, what the market is looking for. But it, it, to me, it kind of has to first align with your taste. Otherwise um, you're kind of faking it, you know? Mm. So I, I really think you want, you need to do the best version of your taste. Otherwise you're, it, you know, you can get lucky and throw darts against the wall, but more often than not, like all of us and whatever, what, I think whatever your profession is, it's like you need to be able to li listen to that, that quiet voice in, in your gut. That's, yeah, that's wonderful. And I think that relates to perhaps, you know, for people that are going to watch this, a lot of them will be writers. And so they'll want to understand, I think, you know, as they're trying to connect with the industry, sometimes they're like, I, I will latch on to whoever wants to to jump onto this project or this script. From your perspective as a producer with what you just said about being passionate, listening to your own taste, would you advise writers one way or the other to shop around to wait for the right person rather than a person that's a good question i mean look i i think it depends on the material and i think it depends on the endeavor um i i have a, a slate of projects um that i that i curate some of them you know are, are when i initiate them or when they're brought to me i genuinely know like okay this is probably going to be an independent project and it's probably going to take a long time. And or I say to myself, like, 
this feel it's more often the filmmaker that I want to work with, but it's like, okay, that's their baby and we're going to nurture it and we're going to hold on to it. And then there's another bucket that's like, this is just big and fun and we can go make a splash and maybe go make a huge popcorn movie. And by the way, you also may need financial resources that only a studio can provide you. So I don't, I think it's really project specific and what that person what he or she wants out of it, because they may be creating a vehicle that they're emphatic about adapting themselves. Okay. That that's one play. Um, and depending on where you are in your career, it's going to be a, a harder challenge. There's one person who says, this is just a big idea. I need a hundred million dollars to make it. Let's go take it to market. Um, so I really think it's, it's the measure of both what the artist wants to get out of the project and also what that specific piece of material may need to come to life. Great. I want to go back in time, back to New York, if we can, and what you said about New Line and working in the marketing department. Um, I think a big question that we get for people that are starting out, perhaps they've just moved to LA or New York or a major market, um, and they ask oftentimes, what's the value of industry experience for just learning the business and being on the mm-hmm. other side of the curtain as a, as a content creator or as a writer? You know, you've, you've ended up as a successful producer and manager, but you were in marketing. Was it just, let me get a foot in the door, let me just get on that side of the curtain and I'll just run with it? Or what was what was your thinking? Sure. I, well, to be clear, I worked in marketing in Disney when I went to New England. Oh, I, I worked me. in development, yes. but that's Sorry. okay. The, yeah. the, the question is, is still resonates. Um, look, I, I I'm a firm believer that everybody's journey is is unique. Uh, for me, I can speak to my experience and how in, it it informed uh, uh, my path. Um, I had always had internships from. Even when I was in high school, I, I worked for the local television station. Um, I've had some, you know, silly fun in terms of like I was an intern uh, for the David Letterman show. I interned for Paul Schaefer for a summer, which was like the, the greatest experience of my life. Um, but also in college, I interned at college marketing programs for movie studios. And I worked for nearly every studio um in washington dc there was like an advertising agency and each studio offered employment so i I was working for five studios at once it was that was very illuminating and um off of that work i got hired by disney and marketing in new york and um i i think those experiences are invaluable working at a studio at any level um just first of all just from a, a global perspective of being in that system and how it works, even if you don't end up there in your career, you're ultimately going to be interfacing with them. So even having exposure to that culture, the mindset, the group think for for better or for worse is invaluable. Um, And then, you know, an extra layer down specific to marketing, um, you know, when you're talking about making a film that's gonna be released by a studio, marketing is essential it's essential in getting sometimes your movie bought certainly your movie marketed and and and, you know the release or otherwise um so to have that exposure i think um is invaluable um and then you know from there i learned a lot about the culture um studio culture and and frankly i i decided it wasn't for me uh, you know, the regime changes or otherwise, where all of a sudden, kind of regardless of, of how hard you're working or how much you, you seemingly are excelling, if there's a if there's a new boss in town, you, you could be out the door. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I experienced that too, and and I'm grateful to have experienced that at a very young age, uh, because um, it it let me know it's not where it's not a position I end up wanting to be finding myself in. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a, and like all this is in retrospect and I think you can't necessarily be overly calculated, but what you can do is make sure, make sure you're sort of throwing yourself in the mix and whatever that opportunity is. So all those experiences like are, are, were really defining, really informative and, and, you know, I, I, I still lean on them today. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And I, I, completely share your view. I think the one thing that I've learned 
from eight years is perhaps as soon as you start to feel comfortable, that's when something bad is about to happen because change change is just the the constant um, thing in the industry. And um, I've been at places where all of a sudden the company gets acquired and and there's rapid, rapid change. Um, I can see, and I'm assuming this, but I imagine this is correct, that perhaps from those experiences, was that part of the motivation for wanting to start your own shop and really control your own fate? It, it was. It was. It really was. I mean, it, it, you know, it's funny. It, when uh, when I was at the studio, uh, there was a regime change. Our, our Basically, our whole department was fired. And then about three or four days later, they realized they needed us back. I mean, primarily my, my boss at the time. But so they hired everybody back. And even that was even, you know, the, the, that sort of irony was not lost on me. I was like, okay, this is just a backward system. So, yes, that was very much the motivation. That ultimately is what probably set me on the path of, of leaving the studio and coming out here and, and making my first movie independently. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, I, I think all those, every, all, all those things have pros and cons. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think there, Mike DeLuca has a quote about like the producer quote of like, it's, it's the best lifestyle, the worst job, I think. And, and inversely, <laughs> you know, uh, studio is, is, uh, best job, worst lifestyle. Anyway, I, I probably butchered it, but that's the essence of it. So I think all sides of the coin, um, you know, have their pros and cons. But but yes, for me, um, making sure I sort of had that autonomy was, it's kind of how I was raised. My, my grandfather started his own company and, and, and I just sort of had been ingrained to me. So it, that, that was my path. But, you know, like I said, it's got, it has its, its pros and cons. And I think everybody's choice and journey is, as long as they're making the the right choice for them, there's, there's no right way. Yeah, sure. It's um it's interesting too because I'm sure you would agree. You know, as when you're working in the indie space, it's kind of like starting a small business in a way. You know, each independent film is its own little yeah. small yeah. business. So, I, I want to talk about hurricane season. To me, it's kind of mind blowing. I guess with. Uh, you know, you're like, oh, I just went and did an indie film in Louisiana and it was like hell, but, you know, I did it. I think it's kind of, for a lot of people, when you hear that, it's obviously very simplified and concise, but there's a lot that goes into that. Would you walk us through perhaps some of the nuts and bolts? Sure. If you, if you don't mind of just, just oh, leading man, up to setting time. that up. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. It, it all started, there was a, um, a one-page piece in the back of Sports Illustrated that Rick Riley wrote about a high school basketball team from new orleans this was the year after katrina that um the team was cobbled together from players from different schools in the region uh and and new orleans had been decimated by katrina and this team came together and they won the state championships and it's just like it, it was just an extraordinary story um but the the piece was small the piece was just a page and it was just sort of like a column so what I mean by that, it wasn't like you would option that article, but the life rights uh, of Coach Collins and the players w- was basically what, what was needed. And that, that was a very competitive, hot pursuit. And it took v- many months, many months to get everybody on board. Um, and so that was the start of it. So that was like part one was making sure you lock down the rights. Um, and then from there... We brought on a writer by the name of uh, Robert Isley, who had just come off of The Great Debaters, which was a movie that um, I believe Denzel directed, Forrest Whitaker starred. And he felt like a very good fit for this material. And that movie probably was either just coming out or he was on everyone's radar. So it it sort of is like anything else I've talked about, even with the, the short stories of like, it's really putting the building blocks together, right? So... We had the rights locked down. Um, we had a, a fantastic writer. Um, and that one was unique. And, and uh, like I said, I, I partnered on that movie with uh, uh, Raymond Brothers, who, who was my, my partner and a dear friend to this day. And uh, he had the foresight where we, we were able to pay for a script. Right? Like everyone was chasing us for the rights, right? And it, it's a good lesson for everyone. Like every case is specific, but as long as you can, Hold on to the material as long as you can, the best. So, so Bob Isley wrote the script, and off of the script, um, I was friendly with 
Forrest Whitaker's agent. And Forrest had, I believe he had like just won the Oscar. And um, he was always our first choice. And sometimes, you know, you, you have these first choices, but you have these first choices for a reason because it's like, usually they're the best fit. Mm -hmm. And we were really fortunate that Forrest read the script. And I think three days later, he attached. Wow. So um, I can't, if I'm being honest, I can't remember when Tim's story came on board. It might have been, probably was before Forrest, but Tim was a great ally for the project and, and you know, was was um, at a, a really high point in his career for having his involvement. And then we had this great package. And part of what was unique about that was we shopped it as a movie versus we as a development project. So we had his amazing life rights, uh, a great script, Forrest Whitaker, Tim Story. And um, at the time, it was the Weinstein Company. So Harvey and Bob financed that film. Um, and that, I mean, that had its own uh, major, major challenges all its own, where uh, we were greenlit uh, and we, for $15 million. And wow. we, I can, by the way, I could, this, this could, this whole uh, Zoom could be dedicated to making this film, but I'll give you the, the brief version <laughs> of it. But, but we hit the ground. And you know, when we sold it to Harvey, they committed to making a $15 million movie. Um, and the second we hit the ground, they said it had to be a $12 million movie. Oh. And, um, you know, look, I, I think to this day, it adversely affected the film. There was so much we had to do by way of eliminating what we showed of the hurricane, which was so essential. Mm. Um, but, but we persevered and we made the best movie we could. Um, we did it in New Orleans. I think it was two years after Katrina. So that in of itself was an entire sort of like sociological, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but, but being on the ground shooting in the ninth ward in literally, um, you know, homes that were destroyed by Katrina. We were, we were using those homes. Um, so it was, it was meaningful. You, you felt a, a real responsibility to tell the story. Um, and, and we made it, uh, that, you know, I can go on because it gets even crazier from there. So we made the film and we were set for a Christmas release. Um, and, uh, it was a time when Harvey and Bob were, were low on cash. They always sort of, you know, they were such a small company that it, it really was like quarterly consistent with how they had done the quarter before. So we were on the, for a Christmas release, they were all set and, they, they hit a, a point where they were out of cash and they pulled it from the Christmas release. And uh, they're like, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll find a time in, in, in the first quarter and you'll be okay. okay. And I, I'll never forget, my mom called me from the video store. And she's like, your movie is in the video store. I was like, oh, no, way. no way. No way. And we called uh, the Weinstein company and we're like, they're like, no, that's impossible. That's impossible. I'm like, she literally like this whole movie. So they ended up uh, dumping the movie. Uh, and uh, I mean, fortunately, it's, it's found a nice life and, and, and people have found it. And, and theatrical, you know, nowadays that line is blurred. So it's just hopefully that the quality of the movie that perseveres whether or not um, it actually played in theaters or not. Uh, but that was, you know, so that was a roller coaster. It really was. And I think, uh, and I talked to people far more experienced than I, that like, you know, how you feel about a movie that you made it really changes over time. So I feel uh, now I feel warmly about the movie and I could look back on it proudly, made, you know, friends for making that movie that I'm still friends with today. Um, and uh, people will, will say nice things about the movie, but you know, there were, there were a handful of years where it, that one hurt just because of how, how it ended up. Cool. Um, but, but every, you know, every movie has, has, a, has a story for sure. So, cool. yeah. Um, I don't know if it's like, okay to ask, I'm kind of surprised after that experience. It sounds like just kind of a crazy sort of up and down that you wanted to double down and come back and do it again afterwards. Like that you were like, yeah, this is cool. Obviously, obviously you love it. Um, there, there's, there's like something to be said when you're shooting, when you're actually shooting that truly feels like rarefied air. And, um, no matter how bad like the day before is, it's really exciting to get up the next day. Like 
you're in this moment in time where you know you're you you have the i mean it really it, i don't know as a kid knowing that this is what i wanted to do when you actually have real money and you're making a movie on a set and uh you know you have x number of days to make it and then it becomes indelible and, and you know that film for better or for worse will, will live forever um it, it, it's i'd be lying if i didn't say it was addictive there, there's something really incredible and special about it so um you sort of get a little bit of amnesia for the for the bad stuff and over time you you kind of just remember the good stuff yeah sure um so i want to jump forward a little bit and talk about where for you in this process because you know we're talking about hurricane season and and obviously learning a lot i would imagine on the fly as a producer as you're dealing with different problems of different magnitudes where did the management idea come in was that a natural extension of a production company for you or what did you how did you go about that it, it wasn't necessarily my my intention um uh, but it, it really started when I, I would found a short or two that I thought were, was really great. And I, you know, I looked at these filmmakers as, as um, people with really bright futures, but also people that needed direction. Um, so it, it just kind of started that way and, it, and it's grown. And admittedly now it, it's, it's, it's a very curated list. People primarily I've been with for a while, but also, definitely you know managing sort of an arsenal of uh prose writers as well mixed mixed with filmmakers um and it i really feel like look i'm, I'm someone that's been married for a very long time and and i, and I say that in the sense of like it's this it, it really becomes a relationship and a partnership and and i i pride myself on people that i've worked with i've worked for for many many years um but i but i say that in the sense of like you know you you learn to support and give and, and understand so I, I i really thrive on on the people that i that i work with but also it's like you know when you start to work with someone you sort of have to ask yourself like are you are you going to want to get a text from this person at you know <laughs> 7 a.m are you going to want to get a text from this person at, at 12 p.m then like and if you're excited about them you have to be excited about them as a person and and as a creator and and you know as someone that, that it's they're, they're, in, they're sort of like your co-workers or collaborators in a way so it, it's got to be fun and and if it's not fun i i don't i don't think it's the right partnership i don't think it's the right client relationship but like you know to all sort of the stressful stories of getting fired and getting money cut out of your film or otherwise um, I say that to say, if you, if you can't find the fun within it, it's, the, the, it's really not worth it. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, in terms of collaborating with people, managing them, it's, it's really has to work on a, on a personal level. I mean, of course you wouldn't be talking to each other if, if you didn't believe in their competence and didn't trust them and all, all that. But, but beyond that, like, if the connection's not there, I think it's too hard. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, and I think perhaps that's something that's lost in the navigation for writers when they're looking for representation. Um, so it's fair to say, I'm right in understanding that it's not only what's on the page, but it's also how they present themselves once they jump in a room with you or jump on a Zoom or whatever. Is that fair? I, it's it's very fair. And I think, look, it, 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 this is a hard lesson and one that I think it's both, you know, hopefully learning over time, but still trying to adjust to it. It's like, it, it's really, I, I think the best work comes when you can remove ego from the equation. And, you know, that's in, in, in taking notes, but also in giving notes and like a creator receiving notes without being defensive. Uh, someone giving notes as an idea, knowing that it may not be the right idea. It doesn't have to be taken and sort of creating the ecosystem where in which through that process, devoid of ego, um, hopefully just the best work presents itself. And that's the only thing is that. And I found in all the collaborations that I have, um, that that's where, where the best work is yielded. And it's very much done in, in our short story development. And it, and it is a true development process. I mean, I always say to people, I'm like, I'll work with you on this, 
Like when we find an idea for, for me with the short stories, it's always about finding some, a voice first. It's very rarely finding the idea first. It's the voice first and their ability. Okay. And then when we find the idea, I, I always like, if they, if I haven't worked with them yet, I'm like, if we're going all in, like we're going all in and you're going to be really sick of me because I'm going to be all over that Google docs, like <laughs> editing the shit out of it. I mean it, but, it, yeah. but, but it's, but, but with the interest of, creating something fantastic if it's your idea if it's my idea it it ought not matter and again like that's a north star that's not we're all we're all guilty of, and of, of failing in that department too right um but the best you can do to strip that away and really just be excited about about finding the best thing is when when the you know the best work is yielded i really believe that sure Every manager, you know, it, it's they have their own onus and their own ownership over what their roster looks like so they can shape it however they see fit. Do you look to diversify your roster in terms of experience, like only keep on perhaps a certain amount of developmental clients or, or how, do you, how do you go about it? Is there, is there a method? Uh, look, I'm, I'm, I, I should clarify, outside of prose writers, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not actively hunting for clients. Let me put it that way at this point. Mm -hmm. So I'm not actively signing. Uh, but, you know, again, it, it's that right situation. If it's if someone who's established, who I know, um, and it makes sense, or, we, you know, something like that. Um, that's not to say, you know, I, I, I'm not taking on clients, but it's not, I'm not regularly out signing. Um, I think it's just about philosophically being aligned. Uh, and I, I had this conversation with someone who I'm considering working with where it's like, I'm not, you know, like it, the best use of me is not making sure you you're working in some TV room, you know, or, or and, and I'm not diminishing that at all. Like, oh, that's fantastic. It's just not what I do, you know, yeah. but if you want to sort of architect some big ideas, whether it be scripts or short stories and really, try to move the needle and, and, you know, that, that's where I like to place my time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it just depends on people's ambitions too, you know, and, and what they're looking to achieve uh, as, as a factor and all that. Yeah, and, sure. And, you know, and every, and by the way, every relationship is different. I have, you know, really experienced filmmakers who have been around a while and, you know, um, some that, you know, I, I produce for most of my clients, some I don't just because of their skill set and what they need. So it's really different. And, and some of it is, you know, hardcore development with clients. Others is like hour, two hour sessions of just strategizing, whether it's a film they're working on, uh, what their what their next movie is going to be. Um, and, and all of it is, 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 I don't know, I love it, but, I, but it's, it's really specific to where that person is. Yeah, sure. The reason I ask is I think there's just a lack of awareness or not awareness, perhaps just knowledge of what the relationship looks like when it's a manager or yep. client for, for emerging yep. writers. I mean, yep. um, I think there's a bit of a misconception that, oh, if I write a great script, cool, that's going to be like my ticket and I can sort of take my foot off the gas. Um, I've had managers explain it to me as, once you do get that representation, that's when your work starts and you better be ready to start putting in the work. Sure. And I, I imagine that's sure. the way that you look at it as well, right? With that relationship. Yeah. I mean, I, I work nonstop because I love it. And I think y you have to be surrounding yourself with people with the same mentality and, and work ethic. Um, Again, this isn't the easiest profession. So if you're not all in and doing absolutely everything you need to do to try to get that edge, there's a good chance it's not going to happen for you. So I say that to say, you know, with that's a two-way street, right? Both with uh, representation, whether it's a client or, or the manager, you want the person who who's all in. Mm. Um and, and look, sometimes you think someone is and they're not, and, and those relationships don't work out. But it, but it really is, um, I, I, it's crucial. Like you, 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 in most 
professions, if you want to be successful, you can't half ass it, particularly here. You just can't. Sure. I want to uh, expand on that a little bit. In your experience, we talked about, you know, relationship building, the ability to network. In terms of reputation, is that something that you sort of guard with your life because of how small the industry is? Yeah. I mean, it, yes. The short answer is yes. It's very important to me. Um, and I think, look, it, it, it's it's how I was raised. Uh, and I, it, it really, I think over time, what you realize is one, one deal really is irrelevant to the big picture of things. And I find when you're younger, myself included, um, perhaps you're responding more emotionally and that's clouding your decision and you're probably apt to be a bit more rash, insensitive uh, and sloppy and messy. And I, and I mean that professionally. I don't mean that in, in like creatively or, or a script or something. Sure. And you do start to realize that these are the same people that you've, you've come up with and they're all rising hopefully. And, and it is a small community and um but it, so it's like it's it, it, look i i think it's generational and people tell me i'm naive but i i think I, I think the generation that i've come up with has a little bit of a different perception than than the one just prior to mine and again people tell me i'm naive for it but i i do think that there's a little bit more of a um authenticity and you know the, the 90s culture is very much, you know, it's okay to lie. It's okay to backstab. It's all part of the game. And I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't feel it the same way. I just don't. I, I sense it. And when I, when I sense it in someone, I, I kind of just shut down and shy away. And it's like, okay, I don't, I don't need to do business with them. Um, and I think, I think it's about, you know, ultimately, um, building your network of people, your coalition of people that you can truly trust. And when I say that, 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 that goes from, you know, uh, clients to uh, producers, to studio executives, you know, literally everyone. And um, it, it takes time, you know, but I mean, I, you know, what you work towards uh, what I work towards is being able to pick up the phone, call someone and they, they know if I'm bringing them something, I truly think it's good. I, you know, I like, I get sent a lot of stuff to take out and I say, no, like I, I, I don't want to be Walmart. I want to be Tiffany. Um, and that's a little bit different than morality, which I think you were, you were speaking to, but it, but it also is one and the same. I don't, I don't need to call someone, and hype them up to try to buy them, get them to buy something that I kind of believe in. It's right. just not worth it. I much rather wait two months, get the thing that I really fucking believe in and think is great. And just like, just know, like this thing is great. I'd be shocked if it doesn't sell. And if for whatever reason it doesn't, my heart of hearts, I feel like it's, it's really solid material and it will, it will find its way. Um, and, and again, you know, I, and I'm not saying if someone's selling a script, that's okay. It, that's not, that's not a morality play, but to me, it's, it's all one and the same of, of, I think it's a, um, it's about authenticity, you know? And I think if, if you can just be as, as authentic as possible, I, I, I hope people recognize that. And, and if it, if, if it means you're going to lose a deal, it hopefully means you'll also get two others because of it. Sure. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. You know, you might, close one door in order to protect yourself and, and whatever else. And yeah. then another one opens because of it. No, I mean, if anybody takes anything away from this is no, no one deal is, is, is worth truly, you know, blowing up your moral compass. It's just not. Yeah, sure. No, it's wonderful. That's really refreshing. I, I haven't heard a whole lot of that. I spent a lot of time on the agency side of the business and you can imagine you don't hear a bunch of, uh, that sort of stuff over there. So that's really, I mean, cool. look, you know, a agents get a bad rap, but it's also systematic. I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, agents as individuals and then there's agencies, you know, and I think I always look at this, every agent is their own person. And I, and, um, I think sometimes that system can, uh, um, can cultivate, um, um, 
a prioritization that that puts the agency in front of decisions that sometimes um you know aren't quote unquote the right decision and i think that's tough um and i think everybody at you know various times finds themselves in some sort of um tough decision there, there's always tough decisions um but um you know i i like i said w- within agencies with, within all arenas regardless of the clichés that are out there i i think they're genuinely good people and those are the people that you you try to go back to and earn their trust and 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 they give you yours sure and you touched on it before as well um you know even if there are cultural whatever like cultural environments that might not as you know might not align with your moral compass as you said you also said something that's really important from a strategic point of view for emerging writers in coming up with a generation of people and i don't know if you'd be willing to sort of share strategically whether you think this is good or not but if you're an emerging writer and you could perhaps connect with an assistant at an agency or an assistant at a production company or an intern or that sort of thing those people are eventually going to rise through the ranks is that yep. pretty accurate yeah it, it's true and i think it's it's um you, oh, over time you start looking around and you're like oh my god i've known that person for 10 years i remember when they were here here and here uh or you know and and i think it it sort of speaks to a, a, a handful of things we were talking about one is you know how we conduct ourselves because it is a, a group of people that will be together for probably a couple of generations frankly if you stick around long enough um but also there there it's a real thrill too because similarly like you've known this person for a long time so to pick up the phone and call them there's a shorthand there's a level of trust um and it, it's exciting i mean we're all kind of in it for the same thing in the sense of trying to make cool shit like at the end of the day that's you know when you, when you come to this town whatever it is you you probably you know money or otherwise but but i, I again i think in 2023 there's there's a lot of other places probably to make a quicker buck i, th- I think mm. it was different you know in the 80s or whatever like people come out here and like you know make money and go hard and like it it, it silicon valley wasn't <laughs> what it, isn't what it, you know what it is today we're like if you're if that's what you're really looking for there's a straighter line is what i'm getting at yeah so i i again i i you're catching me at a moment of rose colored glasses but i truly believe people come out here to make cool shit yeah and i think if if that's what you're leaning into at, at whatever level writer director producer manager like uh, studio executive uh putting that together it's exciting and i think it's it's you know picking up the phone and again calling someone that you know you've sent them good stuff before you've done deals before um I don't know. It 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 you know it, it work and friendships all start to blur together and I'm I'm kind of rambling but I but I you know like I said you're you're catching me at a moment where where I I I think there's a lot of fun to be had here too in in, in the adventure of of this trade. Yeah, no it's wonderful. I'm glad that we are talking to you in this moment because I think this is all incredibly refreshing and it's a lot of stuff that we kind of forget to cover i think you know um because everybody is so deal focused or always looking to just move things forward that that one that one sort of step um so yeah i wanted to just perhaps hand it over to you if there's anything that we didn't touch on for emerging writers i know that you know you've you've, we've talked about ip and getting life rights and that sort of thing for if you're an emerging writer and say you don't have a rep um and you're looking to make yourself more attractive as a prospective client is potentially optioning a piece of ip or is there anything that you can do to sort of diversify yourself and stand out anything that comes to mind for you you know i'll just sort of jump into what came to mind and then and then go from there you know i really think it's about honing your craft and finding your voice uh, and I, and I, the reason why I say that is because the last like two or three things that we've sold, uh, have come from writers that I just like and believe in their voice. And in talking, we figure out what the idea is 
and then go in on it. So, and it, it's that openness and honestly not getting dissuaded. That's really, really important. Like, you know, I, I guess literally the last one we just did, we must've gone through like 10 ideas, got really close on, on uh, Jack working on something. And then this is, it's over that we just did with Akila to, Akila to Sony. And then we're like, well, what about that old idea you had, but we switched this, did this and blow it all up. And cause it was a great idea and he was willing to, you know, strip it and, and start from scratch really. Um, but I say that in the sense of like a, a, a willingness to like, just because someone's saying no to something, like it shouldn't be discouraging both um to the re- shouldn't be discouraging to the relationship it's almost like you want to find someone who wants to work with you and has no problem saying no to you because if, if i'm placating the person that i'm interested in being business with and i'm like yeah yeah that's cool we should work on that well you're gonna go fucking work on that for four months and we're not gonna be able to sell it so I- me saying no to you is like i, I wouldn't and I, I i i repeat this phrase a lot but it's like, I wouldn't be talking to you if I didn't believe in you and think this was going to go somewhere. I have too much to do. Mm. But you pitching me 10 ideas and me telling you all 10 of those ideas. And first of all, I, I could be as wrong as the next guy, but you're talking to me because you, you trust my judgment, right? But if I tell you, I don't think any of these 10 ideas work, go do 10 more. Like, fuck it. Like, it doesn't matter. And it, 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 it and it, there's a certain you know type of person who will then just go and you know, be on to the next person to collaborate with. And by the way, that's fine too. Maybe they think I'm wrong. But my point is, it's like, it's, it's, there, there's a lot within what I'm saying. So allow me just to sort of unpack it as I say it. Please, yeah. But it's a little, it's a little bit of patience, you know? And it goes back to what, even what I was saying in terms of like being young and impatient. And when you do those things, sometimes you, you, you do the wrong thing, right? Uh, morally because you're just impatient. And similarly, it's like, because your 10 ideas are not, you know, the one, you're actually going to waste more time developing the wrong idea for four months. Like it, that's, and again, there's no guarantees at the end of the rainbow that the idea that you ultimately land on is the right one. But if that voice in the back of your head, it's like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'll just do this. It's like, it's probably not gonna work. So. You know, it's really about um, perseverance, patience, and and again, it's that ego thing of just being like, I'm, you know, I I I will find the way, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, I was I, I I I was about to say something, but then it was going to sound like Al Franken of like I'm good enough. But but my point is, is like, you know, you, you 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 can you can be told no ten times, and you can still keep that baseline of believing yourself. Is is what I'm getting at. Because yeah. ultimately, that's what's going to be best for you. Because we all have a finite amount of time to invest in whatever we're doing. So, it, to me, that's really the, the key of ever, anything: is just waiting for that right moment to invest your time. I'm so glad you talked about that because it's a piece of advice that we've tried to really sort of hammer down for emerging writers. It's the the fact that you need to be pliable um, and not sort of die on a hill for if if everybody if the voices around you you have to be willing to accommodate other people's ideas and opinions and it's not lost on me that in the same way that you talked about packages being malleable you're also talking about writers needing to be the same thing and i think it also speaks to the other thing that we talked about in that it's a relationship business and so you need to accommodate for other voices in the room and just be just be accepting of the fact that it is a collaborative process and, and and craft is that all fair it, it is and and i'm in, i'm in agreement with you but i i think the caveat is you know also finding that place how everyone can achieve it differently for me it's a good night's sleep but it, it but what i mean by that is it's what you're thinking in the morning and it's like it is still truly honoring like your quiet voice because yes it's about listening yes it's about being pliable but you also can't defy yourself you know you can't defy your inner voice and that's the hardest thing it's like uh, we deal with it all the time like uh, when i start to get reads on shorts or um, i just have a movie that we just tested and and you you want it I, I think the hardest thing in this business is 
taking that critical feedback and discerning what is going to be valuable to you and what not to listen to. And it's nearly fucking impossible to always get it right. <laughs> but it's, it's, that's the hardest thing because you want to be open. You want to be receptive. You're showing the material to get feedback. Um, but, you know, then it becomes that delicate thing of, okay, well, if I pull this or pull this, the whole thing loses its soul or its essence. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I think it's probably a muscle. That, that over time hopefully gets stronger and stronger. And, you know, my, myself included, like I'll always be asking myself like, all right, like that's a good note. Like this is a smart person giving me three notes. There's one that I really see. I'm going to just do the one that I really see and let the other two just sit. And if I think about them later or it feels like that void is so that they maybe I'll come back to them. But that's that's a really hard thing. And I think that's why, um, you know, and it, it, it's about not being reactionary, and it, it, and uh, it, this comes with, you know, along with what I, along with what I was saying earlier, just like taking it all in, trying to really process it honestly, and like I said, whether that that's a business decision or a creative decision, um, it's all super hard. But um, you know, as long as you feel like you're 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 honoring your 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 inner voice at its quiet moment, you know, whether that's meditation, like it, it should lead you the right way. Yeah. Scott, thank you so much for, I mean, I feel like we kind of unpacked a lot of really deep like things and, and it's really, again, refreshing to chat to someone that's willing to sort of be that open and transparent, I guess, about some of the mentalities that they carry into how they go about their job. That's also refreshing to hear that you're really thoughtful about how you go about the process, both professionally and then also how you sort of conduct yourself in terms of relationships and everything else. Well, thank you again, mate. And I look forward to chatting again in the future. Say bye. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.